first one that we've actually had to come in and, and have a formal event. Professor Floyd is a visiting professor at the Georgia State University College of Law. He's been teaching law for about 20 years now. And during that whole time, he's also been very closely involved with death penalty work. He's represented a number of defendants in death penalty cases. And he also holds a high position in, is it the Georgia Capital Defenders Program? So at this time, I'd like to turn things over to Professor Floyd and let him talk for about an hour. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris, and thanks, everyone. I'm delighted to be here at Duke. Um, we do have about an hour, but I think I'll try not to talk for a full hour. I'd, I'd love to leave at least some time at the end for us to have a little more conversation about some of the issues that I'm going to talk about. I guess the announced title is Religious Faith and the Death Penalty. Come on in. Come on in. Religious Faith and the Death Penalty in America. I'll go ahead and tell you up front, I don't have all the answers to the question about what's the relationship of religious faith and the death penalty in America, but I think I've got some good questions for you. Maybe we can get some conversation going in a little bit. But a couple of facts right up front, let's start with. The first one is, I think you're probably aware that the United States really stands alone among the so-called developed world. Um, that is, I mean, Europe, actually including all of the Western Hemisphere, um, none of those countries um, have the death penalty. Uh, none of our erstwhile allies um, in the world, even Russia, uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, abolished the death penalty. The former republics of the Soviet Union, all countries that want to be a part of the Council of Europe, and there are about 40 now, have to abolish the death penalty be a member not the European Union, but the Council of Europe that enforces uh, the human rights treaties in Europe. South Africa abolished the death penalty shortly after uh, it abolished apartheid. Um, as I say, the Amer United States of America really virtually stands alone. China um, enforces the death penalty pretty regularly. Um, Iran does pretty regularly. Um, Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, did fairly regularly, but um, well, we won't get into Iraq right now, but anyway, the United States is, is virtually uh, alone in its support of the death penalty. But you know, there's another way that the United States is distinctive, um, certainly from its uh, neighbors and allies, especially in Europe, and that is the United States is a much more religious country than the countries of Europe. I need to be a little careful when I just assert that it's a religious country. I'm not really trying to make any moral distinction. But it really, in any measure of religious identification, affiliation, religious observance, um, religious belief, uh, Americans come out much higher. Americans practice and profess religion at much higher rates than Europeans, certainly. Just in 90% of Americans, according to public opinion polls, say they believe in God. Um, majorities of Americans regularly attend worship services. That's certainly not the case in Europe. Well, there's two ways that America is very different, particularly from Europe. That is, it strongly supports the death penalty and is a much more religious country on the measures I just talked about. Is that a coincidence? Is there any relation between those two facts? Um, is there even maybe a causal relationship between the two? That is, is it because America is a religious country we have the death penalty? And I'll tell you right up front, I don't know the answer to those questions. I, I'd, I'd like to have time to have a conversation about it. But I will tell you that Justice Scalia has weighed in on that question. Uh, he, he has said that he believes so. In a speech at the University of Chicago a couple of years ago that was later published in the magazine First Things, he asserted that the more Christian a country is, the less likely it is to regard the death penalty as immoral. And it was really in the context of these same facts I was just referring to. He said it should be no surprise that the death penalty abolition movement has the least support in the church-going United States. <coughs> He at least says it's a causal relationship. Well, we'll return to Justice Scalia a little bit later um, this afternoon. Um, and whether I agree with that or not, I don't, 
we, we'll have to defer that discussion, but I will tell you in a, in a different sense, at a different level, there's no doubt that uh, religious faith and the death penalty in the United States are inescapably related. And it's in this sense. I don't know how much you know about the death penalty, but uh, one feature of the modern American death penalty over the last generation is the United States Supreme Court has insisted that um, the defendant in a death penalty case is entitled to an individualized determination. That is, the jurors, and it, it, we now know jurors must pass sentence in a death penalty case, um, must make a reasoned moral response to not just the crime, but also to the character and background of the defendant. That is, jurors who manage to find themselves sitting on a case where the state's seeking the death penalty are asked to make one of the most morally significant decisions people could ever make. And again, let me explain a little bit more about the death penalty. We don't have a mandatory death penalty in this country. That, the Supreme Court has said, violates the Eighth Amendment, Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause, for, to say that the death penalty has to be given if there's a certain crime. No, in every case where a state says a death penalty is possible, the defendant has the right basically to plead for mercy. Or to put it a different way, um, the defendant has the right to this individualized determination, has the right for the jury to take into account the defendant's character and background. Basically, everything about the defendant's life that otherwise would be irrelevant to the facts of the crime, everything about the defendant's life can and should be considered by the jury so that the jury can make this moral response as to whether this defendant deserves to live or die. I mean, that, that happens in every death penalty trial in America. Well, if it is the case that a um, sizable majority of Americans say that religious faith is important to them, well, I, I think it should be no surprise that uh, jurors' religious beliefs inform their decision if, if they're called upon to make this decision in a capital case. You know, how they do, how they make that decision is, again, something I want to talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> what I'd like to do for just a little bit is talk about um, religious justifications for the death penalty and also arguments against the death penalty that are drawn from religious traditions. Uh, but I need to be right up front with you. Um, I am a Christian. Um, that's my own religious tradition, not just one I was born in, but one that I at least try to follow uh, to the best of my ability is certainly, or maybe I should say, to, by the grace of God I do. Um, but also, as you heard a little bit ago, I, I spend a good bit of my time teaching about, writing about, and actually working uh, in the area of the death penalty. I've represented a good many people who were facing death, defendants in capital cases, and as Chris mentioned a little while ago, uh, I would, one, one thing I've really enjoyed lately is I'm working with the Office of the Georgia Capital Defender in a clinical program where we have students, not just from own school at Georgia State, but also from Emory and from Mercer Law School, um, who work in it and they work on real cases. So I'm involved actually in a good many death penalty cases now. So anyway, that's, that's a little bit about my background on this. I'm, because of that, I'm often asked by people, just people I meet on the street, or people in church, people in school, um, do you believe in the death penalty? Um, and and I've, I've actually struggled with how to an best answer that question because it's a fairly complicated, sounds simple, but it's a little complicated. Um, but I finally decided it's really like the fellow that was asked if he believed in infant baptism. And he scratched his head and said, believe in it? Hell, I've seen it done. <laughs> And that, that's sort of my response on the death penalty. I, I've seen it up close and personal. Um, I mean, from I've been to crime scenes of horrible murders. I've been involved uh, in the public outcry over, over some of the heinous murders that happened. I've been on the bad end of a lot of the public outcry. I've been involved in a lot of the courtroom drama that goes on here. I've um, been involved in a lot of the laborious and time-consuming appeals that go on in these cases. Um, including at least one in front of Justice Scalia. Um, 
Most recently, I was, I was there, I represented a man for eight years in a death penalty case, and I was there two years ago when the United States government um, executed him, my client, Lewis Jones, Jr., who also became my friend. Um, so yeah, I, I've seen it up close and personal in that sense. And I don't mean that just entirely facetiously. If we're going to talk about the death penalty, and whether it really is a good idea, whether it's morally justified or religiously justified, I'm convinced that uh, we need to talk about the death penalty system that we actually have. And not just, you know, in the abstract, whether we think the state taking somebody's life is a good idea or a bad idea. Not that those kind of fundamental questions aren't important, but I'm also convinced that, you know, anytime we start to talk about um, religious views um, in our society, we quickly reach an impasse, it seems. I mean, people talk right past each other. I kind of like the idea of dealing with some fundamental facts. Besides, I think my position of dealing with, you know, the real <laughs> death penalty, sort of the death penalty on the ground, uh, is a theologically respectable position um, that some of you I know are in Professor Powell's seminar, and you, you'll know who I'm talking about when I mention the great Protestant theologian H. Richard Niebuhr. Um, he said the fundamental moral question is, everybody's going to doze off now, sorry. Um, he said the great moral question isn't really what should I do. I mean, that's, that's what ethics is all about. How should I behave in the world? What action should I take? But he said that shouldn't be your first question if you're deciding a moral question. Um, and much less should it be, you know, what would be the right thing to do or um, how would I get the best result? Um, those are appropriate questions, of course, and you ought to be asking yourself those questions. But they shouldn't be the first question. No, Niebuhr said the first question should be, what is going on? That is, get a handle on what's really going on around you. Um, in other words, um, to act ethically, we must first see clearly, understand the context in which you act. Um, so anyway, I think it might be helpful to talk about some facts about the death penalty. Um, so let's do that for a few minutes. In, in some ways, the death penalty is very common in the United States. I mean, it's almost a routine part of our legal landscape. Now, it's easy for me to say that, as I think I told you, I spent 15 years in Texas until last year, so it certainly is uh, a very common phenomenon there, but throughout the South, in North Carolina and Georgia, where it's just my home state and where I've returned, where I live now, death penalty is a pretty uh, regular occurrence uh, in some ways. Since 1977, which is the so-called modern death penalty era, um, there were no executions between 67 and 77 in America, and the Supreme Court declared the death penalty has existed unconstitutional in 72. But in 1976, the Supreme Court um, declared newer death penalty statutes constitutional, declared that under certain circumstances, it's permissible for the state to have the death penalty. Anyway, since that date, uh, there have been 985 people put to death in the United States, executed for crimes. We're, we're approaching 1,000 fairly quickly. We'll certainly reach the 1,000 thousand mark after the first of the year in this country. Not only that, 3,415 people are currently on death row in America. You know, that's a good many people. Um, again, it depends on how you look at it. I was um, a couple of weeks ago at the University of Georgia football game with 92,000 other people wearing red, and so maybe 3,400 doesn't seem like a lot, but on the other hand, 3,415 is more, far more, than all the people enrolled in law school in the whole state of North Carolina, <laughs> and if you take all the law schools here. Or it's more than they're going to graduate from law school this year from every law school here in South Carolina and Georgia, at least the, that many states. Um, or another way to put it, think of it as death row, 3,415 3, people on death row if you took the cells of all those people and literally made a row out of them, and they average, you know, seven or eight feet long, long enough to stretch out in pretty much, is all they are. If you put them in the end, it would stretch for over five miles. I mean, if we, that would be a lot. Um, very few countries in the world have the death penalty at this rate. Most of them don't have it at all. Uh, China executes about a thousand people a year, and that's, that's certainly more, but on the other hand, they have a much larger population. 
Texas, I, I think it's pretty clear, has a higher per capita execution rate than China. Um, Saudi Arabia may have the highest per capita. Well, per capita is not a good word to use with Saudi Arabia. <laughs> So it's in some ways the death penalty is, is common, it, it reaches a lot of people. But let's look at it from another angle. Um, you have any idea how many people are actually arrested for murder in the United States every year? It varies and it's gone down somewhat really over the last 15 years, but oh, any, let's say an average of about 15,000 people. I'm not talking about the number of homicides, I'm talking about the people actually arrested for the crime of murder. Out of those 15,000, fewer than 2% actually receive the death penalty. I mean, the vast majority of that 15,000 are actually convicted of murder or some other form of homicide, but they don't get the death penalty. We reserve the death penalty for a pretty small percentage of our murderers in this country. Uh, and, you know, a much smaller percentage of those that receive a death sentence at the trial level are actually executed, two-thirds of death sentences end up getting reversed at some point or another before the sentence is carried out. Um, and one other fact, you know, over a hundred people who've been sentenced to death in the last generation have been exonerated. That is, have been not just had their sentence overturned, but found out they got the wrong person and have actually been released from custody altogether. So I guess it depends on how you look at it, whether the death penalty is frequent or infrequent. Uh, one quick thing, if we're talking about facts, I think is significant, we need to talk about briefly. The trend is clearly downward recently, pretty much ever since George Bush became president in 2001. I, I don't know whether there's a causal relationship there either, and um, again, let you draw your own conclusions, but nationally, that is, the trend is sharply downward. There were an average of about 300 people sentenced to death nationally each year throughout the 1990s. That is, just take all the states that have the death penalty and just add up how many people actually got a death sentence imposed by a court. Not carried out, but imposed by a court. Average about 300. 1996, there were 320. Even in 1998, there were 300 that year. The year 2000, it dropped to 232. The very next year, 2001, it dropped to 164. Uh, last year, well, actually 2003, 2004, and pretty clearly this year, uh, 2005, we're going to come in at under 150 um, people sentenced to death. I, I'm not sure why that is, and I'm not sure how it relates to the topic of the morning, but if we're going to talk about facts and figures, thought I ought to bring it up. Uh, similarly, the number of persons executed, uh, we averaged between 60 and close to 100 people executed every year through the 90s. Actually peaked in 99. 98 people were executed throughout the United States in 1999. <laughs> and by the year 2003, that had dropped to 65. Last year, 2004, it was 59. 2005 will clearly come in under 50. There have been 45 executed up to this point, but there are only about three or four that are even possible the rest of this year. Most states don't like to execute people in December and Christmas. Uh, so. We're almost through with executions for the year 2005, and it'll come in at under 50, uh, again, which is cut in, cut in half what we had just a few years ago. Why is that? I'll go ahead and tell you what I, I'm pretty well convinced is the main reason for fewer death sentences, and that is people, defendants in death penalty cases, are getting much better representation over the last seven, eight years. Defense counsel are much better prepared, they're better trained. Uh, they understand better what it takes to save somebody's life in a capital case, much better funded, which is maybe the most important part of that. Um, but those people strongly in favor of the death penalty hate to even admit that because I think politically, if we need to quit spending so much money on defense counsel, we'll get more death penalty cases. And I think that's probably right. I think there's a clear correlation there. Um, anyway. So in America, fewer than 2% of murderers actually get the death penalty, and far less than 1% of murderers actually have the death penalty carried out against them. The re and that shouldn't be that surprising, again, if you read the U.S. Supreme Court cases. They say over and over again that the death penalty ought to be rare. That is, death is different. We need to have 
special protection, special procedures in death penalty cases. And what folks often say is the death penalty is really reserved for the worst of the worst. Maybe, maybe not all murderers ought to get the death penalty, uh, but the whole idea is we set up elaborate procedural safeguards to separate it out so that only the very worst, that is the most depraved criminals who commit the most heinous and brutal crimes, get the death penalty. Um, you know, reserved for people like Timothy McVeigh, um, who of course did get the death penalty and was executed. But of course, he's sort of in a class by himself, at least of Americans, um, killing other Americans. Um, he holds the record by far. Um, as you recall, his co-defendant, Terry Nichols, they tried twice to get the death penalty, didn't get it either time. Um, the reason people get the death penalty, I, I am absolutely convinced, and it's not just my opinion, I think it's supported by pretty clear facts, doesn't have nearly as much to do with a reason, moral judgment about who are the most depraved criminals who've done the most heinous and brutal crimes. No, it's, it's some other reasons. And again, you probably have a sense of what those are or what I might say on that. I think the fundamental reason to tie into what I said just a moment ago is the quality of the representation. If you've got um, excellent representation, people that are very good lawyers, uh, who understand death penalty law and how to argue to a jury, how to present mitigating evidence in a persuasive way, if you have the support and you have experts, you have mitigation specialists, you have the mental health experts, if that's an issue in the case, uh, which all takes money, if you're given the money and you're given the time to prepare the case, you don't have to go to trial within a few weeks of the crime, but um, it's hard to get a death sentence against somebody in this country, even in Texas, even in Georgia, even in North Carolina. Good lawyers, good defense teams uh, keep people from getting the death penalty. But of course, the other side of that coin is there are an awful lot of people that haven't had very good representation over the last generation. You may have heard some of those stories about sleeping lawyers at trial, about lawyers who were drunk or on drugs throughout the trial. Um, there are people who have been executed who, when there was clear evidence that their lawyer was high on cocaine or drunk uh, throughout a lot of the trial. There was a guy in Alabama who was executed a few years ago whose lawyer uh, spent a couple of nights in jail during the trial, actually in a cell near him, because he showed up for court drunk and the, and the judge held him in contempt and made him spend the night in jail to sober up. But they started the trial again the next morning. Um, those kind of stories, as I hope I made clear, I, I hope are more things of the past. But again, there are whether you have a good lawyer makes a world of difference on whether you're going to get the death penalty or not. What other factors make a difference? Um, well, I, I hate to say it, but it's, I, I, I'm compelled to tell the truth. Unfortunately, race is still a very large factor um, in who gets the death penalty. Now, you need to, need to be careful how you, you think about this, look at it. If you look at the racial breakdown of people on death row in America, it's close to 50% people of color, 50% white people. Um, I think it's something around 40% African Americans and 10% mainly Hispanic Americans and a few other people of color and about half um, people who'd be cat categorized as white. Well, that sounds disproportionate, doesn't it? Um, obviously, uh, the United States is, isn't 50% people of color, certainly isn't 40% African American. But actually, the, the, the people who are arrested and charged with murder um, are disproportionately people of color. In fact, about half the people charged with murder in this country are people of color. Um, in the state of Georgia, roughly half of all the people charged with murder are African American. So I mean, if you just look at murderers and selecting out which ones get the death penalty, maybe you shouldn't be surprised that roughly the same ratio comes out in those that get the death penalty. But if you look just a little bit deeper, just a little bit below that surface, and what you look at is the race of the victims of the murders, that's where you see something that's pretty stark. Uh, one thing you need to remember is that uh, in the United States, um, people of color are disproportionately the victim of homicide. In my own state of Georgia, over half of all murder victims are black. I mean, violent crime affects uh, racial minority communities much more than it affects white communities uh, in most of America. Um, 
Prosecutors, though, do not seek the death penalty nearly as often when the victim is particularly an African American, uh, and particularly in the states where they seek the death penalty most often. Um, studies throughout America, including one in North Carolina just a few years ago, come up with the same result over and over again. That is, people that kill white people are four times as likely to get a death sentence as people who kill a black person, <coughs> regardless of the race of the killer. If you factor in the race of the killer, black people who kill white people are at much greater risk of getting the death penalty than the other way around. Um, I, it's not for me to say whether there's any conscious racial bias on that. I think a lot of times it may be class at least as much as it is race. You gotta understand how the death penalty is sought um, at the discretion of a prosecutor who are elected officials throughout the South at least where the death penalty is most common. Um, elected officials like district attorneys, um, once there's a notorious murder, they're going to seek the death penalty much more than they are the one that doesn't get, get a lot of press. Death penalty is a lot of trouble to try, and a lot of times they, they might rather not do it, but uh, if there's a lot of public outcry. Well, there's public outcry over prominent people who are murdered. Um, so maybe it shouldn't be that surprising. All I'm suggesting is uh, a system that um, says you're more likely to get the death penalty, far more likely to get the death penalty based on the race of the person you killed, um, is not exactly a system that's getting, you know, the most brutal, heinous murders necessarily. If that's a factor, I hope, I'm sure we all agree, that should not be a legitimate factor. And you know, there's some other factors that go into it. I think more than just the nature of the crime or the nature of the killer, and geography. You know, the, the death penalty um, is, well, over a third of all death penalty, nearly 40% of death penalties in America come out of Texas. Um, if you're, there's plenty of other states. New York is a very comparably <coughs> sized state to Texas in terms of population. They haven't had the death penalty. They really haven't carried it out. Um, there are certain states where you know you're going to get the death penalty much more likely than you are in certain other states. That doesn't have much to do with whether you know it's a really awful crime. Maybe in a federal system that's okay. That's that, but that's a different consideration than just whether a person deserves the death penalty or not in that particular case. But a couple other things about the geography, even within a state. I can tell you about my own state of Georgia. There are a handful of counties where if you commit a murder, the DA is pretty likely to seek the death penalty. There are many more counties where if you commit a murder, highly unlikely to seek the death penalty. Again, you can um, look at all the other variables in the case and they, they can be pretty much even, but where you commit the crime, one side of a county line or the other can make a big difference. Even things like when you do it, at least in smaller counties in Georgia, um, Trying a death penalty case is an expensive proposition. There's story after story of um, where a, a smaller, maybe a rural county, had a big death penalty trial, and then another case comes along, and the county commissioners go to the district attorney and say, we can't afford another death penalty trial this year. It would bankrupt the county. <laughs> um, and from the county commissioner's point of view, you can understand why they say that, but again, what does that have to do with the moral blameworthiness of the killer in, the, in that case? None of these factors have anything to do with um, the moral blameworthiness. So I, I'm just telling you, we don't get the worst of the worst. Although, again, you're thinking, yeah, but what about Timothy McVeigh or some of the older folks in the room? May remember Ted Bundy. Um, not married with children. That was Al Bundy. Ted Bundy was a horrible serial killer. Um, and if anybody ever deserved the death penalty, he's probably... Probably a knee guy. But you know what? Think about some other people you've heard of more recently. Remember Eric Rudolph? Hit out in the western part of this state for a long time. Um, the Olympic bombing in Atlanta killed a couple of people there. Killed a couple of people in Alabama when he planted bombs at abortion clinics. Eric Rudolph was a terrorist. <laughs> Is a terrorist. He, he killed innocent people who had nothing to do with whatever political issue he was protesting just to make a political point, certainly the killings in Atlanta. We're engaged in an international war on terror. 
I mean, I agree with the administration when they say, you know, the worst things we could face are people that are willing to take innocent lives just to make a political point. And yet, right here in our own backyard, somebody like Eric Rudolph, who killed uh, several people and wounded scores more in several bombing, they didn't get, he didn't get the death penalty. Um, they offered him life. Um, I mentioned Terry Nichols, McVeigh's co-defendant. They actually sought the death penalty against him twice. Once in federal court, they couldn't get it. They sought it again in Oklahoma. They didn't get it. Um, remember the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski? That's terrorism. I mean, a weird distortion. Not sure what his motivation was, uh, but he was killing people uh, by mailing bombs to them. Remember Susan Smith, who drowned her little children, um, drove the car into the lake, jumped out at the last minute? Um, horrible case. She didn't get the death penalty. It's not for me to say whether they deserved it one way or the other, but if what, if what we're trying to say is only the very worst get it, I can point to many other cases where people did bad things, but... Um, it's hard to see how the people who got the death penalty are worse than those people. And then the one other factor I mentioned briefly before, what about people that are innocent? There have been over a hundred people that really not any dispute about uh, were sentenced to death, were on death row, and then later on evidence was uncovered to show they actually got the wrong person. It's, it's clear, we're not, it's not that we're not picking out the very worst of the murder, sometimes we don't even get the right person in our flawed criminal justice system. And again, if you know very much about the criminal justice system, that shouldn't surprise you too much. It's made up of fallible human beings operating under pretty severe pressure sometimes. Um, well, I told you we needed to talk about the facts, and so that's at least my version of the facts. I know some other people might come in here and dispute some of it, but I think so far what I've talked about is sort of the, the lay of the land, how the death penalty works. But let's do talk a little bit more about more moral, even religious justifications for the death penalty. President Bush, who um, has presided over more executions than anyone, I think in American history, certainly in modern American history, over 150 people were executed in Texas while he was governor, and then there have been three since he's been president he presided over federal executions. I want to quote to you something that he said, something that I um, actually like. You may remember this. It was in one of the debates back in 2000. Um, he was asked, it's one of those town hall kind of debates where they had people off the street in to ask questions, and, and, a, and a guy asked a question about capital punishment. <laughs> and he said that he asked, directs this question to Governor Bush. He says, in one of the last debates, the subject of capital punishment came up, and in your response to the question, you seemed to kind of overly enjoy, as a matter of fact, kind of proud that Texas led the nation in execution. Sir, are you really, really proud of the fact that Texas is the number one in executions? Governor Bush. No, I'm not proud of that. The death penalty is very serious business, Leo. It's an issue that good people obviously disagree on. If you think I was proud of it, I think you misread me. I do. I was sworn to uphold the laws of my state, and so that's what I've done. Um, and he goes on for a while about what a difficult decision it is. Uh, but he goes on again to say, I'm not proud of my record. Follow-up question by Jim Lehrer. Do both of you believe the death penalty actually deters crime? Um, and Vice President Gore says, yes, I do. Governor Bush, I do. In fact, that's the only reason to be for it. I don't. I don't think you should support the death penalty to seek revenge. I don't believe that's right. I think the only reason to support the death penalty is because it saves other people's lives. Um, pretty definitive statement. Again, you've had criminal law, and you know about general theories of criminal punishment. He is clearly coming down on the side of the reason to punish, at least in the death penalty context, is only for deterrence purposes. We, sh we can execute people, but only if it has the effect of saving lives. You can argue deterrence in a couple of ways. One is so-called specific deterrence, and that's kind of hard to argue against. That is, if you kill the person who killed, that person is not going to kill anybody else again, right? I mean, that's kind of irrefutable. Um, <laughs> And in fact, that's something people worry about. Even if you give somebody a sentence of life, life without parole, well, they could still kill a prison guard or somebody else in prison. There's even the possibility, God forbid, of escape of one of these. So, you know, killing him is one way to ensure that person doesn't kill again. But that's not, I don't think, what Governor Bush had in mind entirely. I think he's talking more about general deterrence. It saves lives because the murder rate goes down. He's, he's 
part I didn't read, he said, because we have the death penalty in Texas, our murder rate went down. Of course, the murder rate went down in every state in the 90s, including in New York and Michigan and other places that didn't have the death penalty, actually at faster rates than it did in Texas. Um, but his, his point, and I don't mean to, to minimize it, is um, he thought revenge was wrong. Now, you remember Governor Bush was speaking as a Christian himself. Uh, he made it clear throughout that campaign and throughout his public life how important his own Christian faith is to him. Um, but deterrence is not really a moral or a religious question. Deterrence is an empirical question, right? It's something you can study with evidence and you can just figure out, maybe, whether if you have the death penalty or you have the death penalty of a certain kind, will the murder rate go down? Will it save lives? And there have been some studies like that. Uh, there is a moral aspect of deterrence, though, I think. Um, if you think that you know, killing people, including through state executions, is something we, that we ought to take very seriously and only do if it's absolutely necessary, there probably at least ought to be a presumption against it unless the evidence that it saves lives is you know, overwhelming or unambiguous. And on that point, I've got to tell you, it's not. The evidence, the, and a lot of social scientists have studied it, evidence is inconclusive at best. The great weight of the evidence, in fact, shows that the death penalty is not a deterrent, that having the death penalty doesn't cause murder rates to go down. It might cause some people not to commit a murder they otherwise would have, but I hate to tell you, I'm not proud of it, but I've known a good many murderers in my life, and most of them don't think that way. You know, thinking in a, at some point, if I could commit this crime, I could get the death penalty from the state isn't, it, it, it's just always been counterintuitive to me to think it would be a deterrent. Apart from what Governor Bush said there, many more people justified the death penalty um, on what's the grounds of re retribution. That's kind of got a negative connotation in some people's minds, and it really shouldn't. Uh, maybe a better way to put it is just on grounds of justice. That is, in some cases, for some killers, um, justice demands nothing less than the death penalty. I mean, there are some crimes that are just so horrible, and maybe McVeigh is the name that ought to come into your mind here. Um, that is, Another way to think of it is respect for the life of taken. The sanctity, the preciousness of the life taken requires the taking of the killer's life. Nothing short of that would really be justice. That's the argument I hear more commonly, and I think really is the more compelling argument in favor of the death penalty. I've heard it from victims' families. The man I represented who was executed a couple of years ago uh, the family of the young woman that he killed were quite articulate, but also very outspoken and vehement in wanting him executed. Uh, they often said that anything less than his death would dishonor the memory of their sister and daughter. Um, or they'd say, we couldn't feel like we got justice, or the system is a just system, if he's allowed to continue to you know, breathe the air every day, turn on the television occasionally, talk to his daughter on the telephone, Tracy, their daughter, got to do none of that thanks to him. What's fair or just about a system that allows him to do those things when she doesn't? That's not a deterrence argument. That doesn't have anything to do with the effect of his execution on anybody else. That's saying justice cries out. Um, her blood cries out from the ground, to use a biblical phrase, which they did. Um, and, you know, certainly in particular cases, I mean, apart from retribution as a general justification of the death penalty. Remember what I told you earlier about the way the death penalty really works in an individual case. Every case, the jury must make that individualized determination. It's always a moral choice. They're not deciding whether if we kill him, it'll save other lives. I mean, they might be in favor of the death penalty generally for that reason. No, they've got to decide, does this person deserve the ultimate punishment? Um, the person that we're looking at, that we've heard about, in this case. But as I said before, is if our goal is to kill the worst of the worst, we fail. Even if retribution is a valid purpose for the death penalty, our current system in America isn't choosing those people that really deserve it uh, more than all the others. Um, and you know, I'd suggest to you that we're bound to fail on that. And I, I don't think I'm a cynic, I think I'm a realist. Um, I think I've worked enough in the criminal justice system to know I just don't think we have the wisdom, either individually or collectively, to, to 
finally make those decisions about who really deserves to die, who is so bad they don't deserve to live any further on this earth. Um, when jurors in America do make that decision, uh, I think we shouldn't be surprised they do look at religion. There's one, this is a law school, so I should mention a case. I've got one case I want to tell you just a little bit about. I had thought when I accepted the invitation to come here, it might be a case the U.S. Supreme Court would be deciding. Uh, a lot of people predicted they'd grant cert. They actually denied cert this past month. Um, might be just as well. It's a Colorado case, a case from the Colorado Supreme Court, where what happened in it uh, at trial death penalty case, they go back there to deliberate on the sentence. A couple of jurors brought in Bibles. They even brought in a Bible index. I'm not sure what they mean, a concordance. They called it a Bible index in the uh, opinion. Um, and it was checked, marked on certain passages that clearly some people thought might be directly applicable to the decision they had to make. It was checked um, from a couple of passages in Leviticus, uh, including the famous eye for an eye passage. Um, Checked from Romans uh, chapter 13 about the authority of the state uh, to exercise the sword. Um, the question on appeal was, did that somehow violate the defendant's rights for jurors to turn to the Bible? The California, Colorado Supreme Court said, under these facts it did. Now, they went on to say, we do not hold that an individu individual juror may not rely on and discuss with the other jurors during deliberation his or her religious upbringing, education, and beliefs in making the extremely difficult moral decision he or she is called upon to make in the penalty phase under Colorado law. We hold only that it was improper for a juror to bring the Bible into the jury room to share with other jurors the written Leviticus and Romans text during deliberation. The text had not been admitted into evidence nor allowed pursuant to the trial court's instructions. I guess if somebody had been able to recite from memory those Bible verses, in fact, they sort of say that. They say it's the written uh, material that makes a difference. In fact, the court says, the written word persuasively conveys the authentic ring of reliable authority in a way the recollected spoken word does not. Some jurors may view biblical texts like the Leviticus passage at issue here as a factual representation of God's will. The text may also be viewed as a legal instruction issued from God requiring a particular and mandatory punishment for murder. That's not a fact presented in evidence, and it's not a legal instruction authorized under Colorado law. Uh, it was a three to two decision, very close in Colorado, and there have been a lot of other states and federal circuits that have kind of gone the other way on that question. Is it appropriate for jurors to look at the Bible? I had thought the Supreme Court might just take that case, but they didn't. We'll have to wait another day for them to return to that one. Let me return now to Justice Scalia speaking of the Supreme Court. In the talk I was referring to earlier where he, he said, you know, Christian America is more accepting of the death penalty than secular Europe, and we shouldn't be surprised, it's precisely because America is Christian primarily. Here's the, the kicker phrase. He said, you know why that is? Because for the Christian, death is no big deal. What does he mean by that? Well, he explained it a little bit more. He said, for the atheist, for the secularist, Death is a big deal because it's clearly final. There's nothing else beyond this earthly existence and the, the cessation of earthly life is a big deal. But for the Christian, you know, there's, there's more to life than this, um, what we have just on this earth. Maybe I don't even need to say it, but here's my problem with what Justice Scalia had to say there. Uh, we're not talking about death here alone. We're talking about killing. Seems to me there was something in the Old Testament about killing, uh, but there's a lot more in the New Testament about it as well. Um, let me give you my perspective on the death penalty. Now I will, if you'll allow me, speak just a little bit more personally here from my own experience. I want to tell you about my last night uh, with Lewis Jones, Jr., the client who was executed a couple of years ago. Uh, I had gotten to know him quite well over eight years, representing him throughout that time, including a, an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court which we lost five to four. We, we came that close several times in different places, but um, lost in the U.S. Supreme Court. If we had time, if we had hours, I'd tell you about all the issues in the case. But well, that's not my point here. I want to talk about actually his death. Um, Lou was guilty of this horrible crime. Uh, he was 
Um, he confessed to it right up front. Um, he never tried to dispute it. And he felt uh, tremendous guilt, remorse over it. Um, he knew he deserved to be punished. At some deep level, I think he probably believed he ought to be executed for it. Um, he allowed me to fight his execution, I think largely because he had a daughter that he loved, his daughter Barbara, and he worried constantly about what happened to her if he was no longer alive. Now he's in prison. He's going to spend the rest of his life in prison even if I won. And yet he had a strong relationship <coughs> with her. He, was, believe it or not, was a positive influence on his daughter even from where he was. He was a remarkable man. Again, I don't have time to get into all of it, but I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about his last night. Uh, I spent most of that night with him. He was executed at 7 a.m. That's when the federal government does it. I don't know why. That's just their timetable for it. Um, I spent most of that night with him, and we had some shifts. Barbara spent some time with him, and his pastor, who we've known very well since he'd gone to death row, and he had a conversion experience. This pastor spent a good bit of time with him, but I had several hours with him alone. We prayed together. Uh, we, he told stories about his childhood. He wanted to talk about his mother a lot during the last night. Um, he talked um, about the hymns she loved, and uh, he, was, he was trying to remember the words to, to one of them, Jesus, keep me near the cross. And I'm about one of the few death penalty lawyers in America that could help him on that. He was, maybe that's providential. I knew all the words to it, so we went through that. Um, and i got to tell you, it was a difficult night, but it was also in some ways almost an uplifting night to have this man because he faced his impending death with a strong personal faith, with dignity, with grace, um, grace that he was given. The last hour and a half before, an hour and a half before the scheduled execution, I had to leave because they had to take me somewhere else and then bring me back to witness the execution itself. His daughter Barbara was, was with us at that point. She was not going to witness the execution. She was 22 at that point. Lou made the decision, and I think she agreed that she was going to be with him until they, had, they took her away, but she wasn't going to actually witness the execution. But Barbara and I and one other person from the prison ministry who had worked with him and the pastor I mentioned and the prison chaplain and the supervisor of federal prison chaplain from Washington, we all had a, a communion service. Uh, right at the end, in which we went around and um, had little crackers and grape juice, but the pastor went through the communion liturgy. Um, at the end, partly sort of as a stalling tactic, but not really, had everyone um, say whatever they want or offer a prayer, and we all did, and got to Lou last. Um, he was on the other side of glass. We couldn't touch him. They actually had to serve the communion through a little slot. We had to leave the room while they passed it through a slot. Um, pass the communion to him, we finish that, get time for him to respond. Uh, he looks at us, he puts his hand on the glass there, and then raises his head, and he says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That was obviously a difficult thing for us to experience, but on the other hand, in a way it shows the truth of what Justice Scalia was saying. In some ways, death was no big deal. This was a man of faith who was prepared to meet it. He helped the rest of us face it. Um, within the next hour, I actually watched him be executed. And it, for his last statement, in addition to a written statement that he, gave, he wanted me to give to the family of the woman he killed, um, his own oral words were, he, he sang the words of Jesus, keep me near the cross. And he quoted uh, some from Psalm 118 again. Uh, and then his life was over. Um, that was hard for me to witness it, but actually my wife um, was um, at our hotel room there in Terre Haute, Indiana, with Barbara while her father was killed. Um, let me tell you, um, Lou Jones' death was a big deal. Um, it was a big deal for Barbara that her father was killed. It's also true that th this death drove home to me once again, maybe more than it ever had, the evil it is of taking another human life. Or to put it another way, the, the, the sacredness, the preciousness of each individual human life. Uh, Tracy McBride's death haunts me still to this day after all these many years. I, mean, I never knew her in life. I only got to know who she was because my client who became my friend murdered her. But anyway, the execution drove home for me Again, how precious we all are in God's sight. Um, 
taking a human life um, is not what God wants, I think. Now, I'm not telling you right now what religious faith has to say about the death penalty. I'm not even telling you what Christian faith has to say about the death penalty. I'm telling you my own personal faith and how it affects the death penalty, but I think maybe that's, that's the best way we can talk about these kinds of issues. Um, I think when we, when we do take each other's life under whatever circumstances, no matter what the person might have done, I think it breaks God's heart. Um, God can deal with it, unfortunately for us, and God doesn't let us go. So anyway, I haven't really told you um, what role religious faith ought to play. I really just wanted to, to share those thoughts and tell you that story. And looking at the clock, um, I wanted to get your reaction, if, if you're willing to, about this general question of religious faith and the death penalty. You can either speak personally if you want, or if you want to offer a suggestion. I've got some speculation. Why is it that in the United States of America, which is far and away more religious than um, other countries that don't have the death penalty, is their relationship? I say I've got my own speculations about it, but I wanted to hear from any of you. Um, I was wondering, you said that um, one of the, the victim's families, um, I guess, invoked Leviticus. Or no, that was in the jury. That was in that Colorado okay. case. Well, Although, um, actually, Tracy McBride's family did, too. They were a deeply religious family. They were from Minnesota, in fact, uh, and were active in a church. And I tried to reach out to them through pastor we had with their pastor and were never able, never able to have direct communication with them and I mean I, I was scared to death to do it but it felt like we should but yeah I interrupted you they they also cited Leviticus eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth very frequently okay well if, if maybe you know more than one person has done this that they, they invoke you know Leviticus some older testament thing and then Romans where um, the authority of the state um, how in your experience, how do people reconcile those things with what Jesus tends to say, turn the other cheek? And I guess his outlook of, which I would, I think, uh, lends more to loving thy neighbor and forgiveness. It, it is a little ironic that people continually cite eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth because Jesus said, you know, I, I came to fulfill the law and I'm, I'm all of the law. Um, every bit of it except that particular verse you remember right there in the Sermon on the Mount he says you have been told eye for an eye tooth for a tooth but I tell you I mean that's one where pretty specifically he says um, forgive your enemy love your enemy it's, it's an impossible thing for us to do in a lot of ways but it's pretty clearly what Jesus called us to do and what Jesus actually embodied so I don't have an answer for you um, I think for whatever reason um, we see the horrible things people do to each other and, it, and it, it breaks our own hearts and our reaction is we got to do something about that to stop it. Yeah. This is just my speculation, but um, Romans 13 talks about how the state doesn't bear the sword for nothing or government doesn't bear the sword for nothing and um, exhorts Christians to submit to the earthly authorities um, that are doing justice. Um, in a, a liberal democracy like the United States, <clears throat> I think, as a Christian, um, one thing that isn't discussed a whole lot is whether or not sort of the state has to execute people in order to carry out justice, or whether or not Paul was talking about a time when that's how the state operated and Christians didn't have much to do with it. But in a place where Christians have a choice, and some say in whether or not the state um, carries the sword literally or carries the sword sort of figuratively in the way they go about doing justice. Um, I don't think that connection is made very explicitly. Yeah, I, I think it is certainly the case that when Paul's talking about the authorities, he's talking about very different authorities. Um, he's talking about the Roman Empire. He's talking about actually the Emperor Nero, probably when Romans was written. Um, that's a very pretty different uh, kind of phenomenon. Now, that may cut the other way from that point. Um, if the United States government, a liberal democracy, wants to have the death penalty, you ought to support it. But on the other hand, first of all, I don't, I don't want to get too much into biblical exegesis here. That passage doesn't authorize the death penalty. It says, you know, governments exist to keep people in line. Well, I hope we all agree with that. 
Um, and that's a good, that's not the same thing as saying a government is required to have a death penalty for certain kinds of crimes. I, he never says that at all. Uh, I think it's basically an open question. I think you can certainly argue it either way. Either. Uh, just a related to, uh, question to the first one. Uh, there was a lot of public outcry from Christians with regard to the Supreme Court decision in Colorado, Colorado State Supreme Court decision that right. outrageous that the Bible can't be. There was a smaller criticism uh, from maybe theologians or, or those, maybe the clergy, some smaller elements of the clergy that said the real outrage here is not that there was Bible cited, but that they stopped, they went straight to Romans 13 without going two verses before and talking about don't repay evil for evil or don't know what the gospel. Then saith the Lord is just immediately it, before that. Exactly right? right. And so to what degree is that debate, which verses to cite, a, 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 a venue for the attor for attorneys who practice the Christian faith uh, to be to engage in because you you it's in the the great deal of the first part of your talk address some of the elements of expertise that you have that the clergy or the theologians maybe don't have facts on the ground to what yeah. degree should, should attorneys think about well, uh, at biblical exegesis that you um, <clears throat> you know good trial lawyers have always known how important the Bible is and being persuasive to folks because uh, at least certainly in the part of the world where I come from most people traditionally have been pretty familiar with the Bible they take it seriously and. I've used it. <laughs> um, the fact that the yeah you could argue these jurors chose verses I wouldn't have chosen for them to read. But the last thing in the world we want, I think, in a secular society, is for the judge to be telling. Well, if you're going to read the Bible, I, I direct your attention to these verses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I don't want to go down that road. Um, I honestly don't even know what I think about that Colorado decision. As somebody who's generally opposed to death penalty defense people in these cases. It would bother me. But you know what? The defense lawyer in that case argued from the Bible. She used the Abraham and Isaac story, actually. I'm not sure. I haven't actually read the transcript. I only heard that. Um, that, you know, God showed. You know, Abraham was prepared to sacrifice his son, but then, of course, he didn't have to. And you don't have to either, I think was your point. <laughs> um, and that's, of course, what the state was arguing. That she opened the door to that. If she's going to argue from the Bible, the jurors ought to be able to. The problem really was it was sort of done in secret and without and it wasn't supervised, and courts try to be very careful to make sure jurors only decide cases based on the evidence and the law given to them. But that's not at all saying that their own individual moral and religious judgment shouldn't be brought to bear. Of course they should. And I would defend forever that we can't tell jurors, you know, put your religious, check them at the door before you go into the jury room. I hope that, I hope people don't read this opinion that way. Oh, that's what the law is. I, I think it can be read, hopefully, as much narrower that you shouldn't bring in extraneous written materials to the jury room and leave it at that. A little low on time, but um, uh, people need to leave for questions. But uh, I, I can say as having had personal conversations with you uh, on, the, on this issue, but we, one thing I know you talked about was sort of relating the traditional do Christian doctrine of uh, just war uh, to the death penalty. And I was wondering if, in the small time we have left, if you could sort of talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, most Christians throughout Christian history, the 2,000 years, have not said that it's always and everywhere an evil, wrong thing to do to take a human life. There's sort of presumption against taking a human life, but you mentioned the just war tradition. Uh, certainly since Augustine and, and certainly since Aquinas, um, Christians have justified, um, theologically that is, that under certain circumstances it's the lesser of evils to go to war and take human life. Um, I, I, yeah, you're right. I wrote a little article where I applied some of the just war principles to the death penalty and found it sorely lacking. That is, even if you think that maybe the death penalty can save lives and therefore it's a good, it's a justifiable thing to do to take guilty human life in order to save more innocent lives, uh, that's really what just war thinking is all about. Uh, if we don't go to war to fight Hitler, including even killing otherwise innocent civilians, worse consequences happen. I mean, that's the idea. Um, you still ought to be bound by certain kinds of principles, and that is use only the amount of force necessary, use force only if it is a last resort, and several other principles like that. Um, we, we don't think through the death penalty nearly that comprehensively in this society. We just sort of have a, I mean, we have the kind of system I described, which I think falls far short of, even if you think that's the right way to look at it, we don't really comply with it. Yes, sir. Um, Point or anything, but it just—it seems like there's a huge question as far as you know. When Jed brought up to the, the guy behind me, brought up is that um, 
as a Christian lawyer, I believe that we we're kind of called into living in this this tension and to uh, where we're taught to, you know, in the in the New Testament, especially we're taught to love mercy. And there's also a passage where Jesus said, "If a man takes you to court for your tunic, give him your cloak as well." And you know, we're taught to you know to love mercy and to forgive. But then we have to operate in the society, which is different from the one where Paul was writing in, where we didn't really have a say necessarily in the government. But we now that we do um, we have this tension of where we have to forgive. But they're also, we just can't let crimes go unpunished, you know. So there's just a tension that we all have to it, balance and figure it, out. It's, it's a it. tremendous tension. Um, if you take those passages seriously, which I would hope most people that um, claim to be Christians would, can you sue somebody? Paul says no, you can't. Um, can you engage in, in acts of violence? Well, certainly parts of the Sermon on the Mount make it clear you shouldn't. Um, I don't have the answer to that either, but I'll give you, this is a plug, and it's a plug for something that um, I don't mind doing. Um, There's a book that I was the co-editor of, and the title of the book is, Can a Good Christian Be a Good Lawyer? Um, I'll plug it because I didn't write any of it. Um, I just brought it together. Um, I encourage you to look for it. It's published by Notre Dame Press. You can find it on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. There's a copy in the library here. And yeah, you can check it and get it free um, <laughs> temporarily. Um, but um, the reason I'm willing to plug that book is it's got a wide diversity of authors in it who come at it from you know, lots of different perspectives, all of whom are Christians and struggle with exactly the kind of questions you're talking about. I'm not sure most of them have definitive answers, but I think if you, if you want to struggle to live faithfully to the gospel, but also perform your duties as an attorney, um, you ought to struggle with those questions. And it's, it's good to have the guide of other people with more experience who've thought it through and worked through a lot of those questions. Um, some of them reach very different conclusions from each other, but that's, again, part of the value of it. So I recommend that. Let me give you one other resource, really, that it's drawn from. Um, originally, most of those essays were published in a special issue of the Texas Tech Law Review, which is free, available to all of you, as long as you have Lexus and Westlaw, which I know you do. Um, it was in 1997, I don't even have the site off the top of my head, but it's easy enough to find the Faith in the Law issue of Texas Tech Law Review. And what's especially good about it is, instead of just the 20 some odd Christian authors in the book I mentioned, it's got 45 lawyers from a much wider range of religious traditions. Uh, several Jewish authors, uh, a Muslim lawyer I know pretty well who wrote a great essay, um, Hindu, a Buddhist. Um, anyway, all, again, trying to answer that same kind of question, set of questions, and I, I urge you to look at that. Fordham University Law School has a great center on uh, religion and the lawyer's work, um, and they've collected a good bit of material. You can find that right on their website for Fordham Law School. So I would urge that. My point is, Whatever I have to say is, you know, one person's witness, but uh, I think the more you can hear from other folks uh, who might have different perspectives on it, the better it is to do a lot of these questions. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.